Good morning, everyone. It's good to finally be here. I, I feel like um, at NCCF, we think of RLCF as our extended church family. And so it's wonderful to finally see you all. And we're eager, my wife and children are back there. We're eager to fellowship with you all today, spend time with you. There have been so many people from NCCF who have come here and who have um, raved about the spirit of unity and love among this church. And we're eager to be a part of it and grateful. So thanks for having us here today. Um, today I was hoping that I could share just briefly about how um, seeing and knowing God should change us um, and how we should be very suspicious of any unwillingness that's in our hearts to change um, when the Lord has revealed himself. Um, blindly, one thing that kind of came to me this week as I was thinking about what to share is blindly continuing in old habits or old attitudes without being willing to examine whether they should continue is, is kind of playing with fire. Our goal should always be to be useful to the Lord and uh, we should always be willing to be purged of any impurity that he sees in us. And um, the way God reveals impurity in us oftentimes is by revealing himself. So when he shows us who he is, we ought to change. There ought to be a change that corresponds to God revealing himself to us. Um, and I, this kind of came to me as I was reading in uh, Genesis. So if you want to turn there to Genesis chapter 20, I was reading um, about Abraham's life this last week, and this, there's a verse that really stood out to me. We can start in Genesis 20 chapter, or sorry, at verse 10. So this is where Abraham told Abimelech that Sarah was his sister, and Abimelech took Sarah, and luckily God protected Abimelech, kept him from... Um, taking Sarah into his room. But in verse 10, Abimelech says to Abraham, what have you encountered that you have done this thing? Why did you lie to me is what he's saying. And Abraham said, because I thought surely there's no fear of God in this place and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she actually is my sister, he kind of rationalizes. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came about, this is the verse that struck me. It came about when God caused me to wander from my father's house. This is back in Genesis 12. That I said to her, this is the kindness which you will show me. Everywhere we go, say, to, say of me, he is my brother. And I was thinking about, since Genesis 12, when God called Abraham, he took him on a pretty wild ride. I mean, if we, we don't have time to go through it, but in Genesis 13, God shows him the promised land. After he separates from Lot, he shows him the promised land, and he promises that his descendants will be as numberless as the dust. And then in Genesis 14, he receives a blessing from Melchizedek. He has this um, kind of amazing interaction with this priest who's, a form, who's kind of a shadow of the high priest that Jesus Christ reveals, is revealed to be. And then in chapter 15, God makes a covenant with Abram. Um, and Abram, he actually allows Abram to see a flaming torch pass between the pieces of meat that he lays on the altar. And then chapter 17, God overlooks, Abram, Abram tried to take matters into his own hands with Hagar. God overlooks that and forgives him and promises to give him a son through Sarai and gives him a new name, not just Abram, but Abraham. And he enacts a covenant through circumcision with him. And then in uh, chapter 18, he appears to him at his tent as three men and he shares a meal with him. And he even has an amazing interaction with him about how many righteous people have to be in a town for me to be willing to save it and not destroy it. All that say, since God, he says, since God, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, there's been a lot of amazing interactions that Abraham had with God. And yet, um, he, and he had so much more of a concept who this God was who called him than he did when he was just in Genesis 12. And yet what I see here is there's this old pattern of behavior. This, when it says in verse 13, I said to Sarah, do this for me. Everywhere we go, say that I'm your brother, basically. What I see there is that he allowed this old pattern of behavior to persist. This agreement that he had made long before he really came to know the Lord as well as he knew the Lord here in verse 20, in chapter 20. And he never really questioned whether that was an okay thing to do. Despite the fact that he had come to know God so much better, he allowed this old pattern of behavior, this old agreement that he made with Sarah to persist. And I see it almost derailed his life. I mean, Sarah didn't conceive Isaac until chapter 21. It says in verse 1 that the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah wasn't even pregnant with Isaac yet. And Ab I see this as Abraham's playing with fire. I mean, all of be because of some ridiculous fear. I mean, he's already been given a new name, the father of multitudes. 
What need does the father of multitudes have that I'm afraid that you might kill me because she's my wife? Father of multitudes does not be afraid, and it doesn't need to be afraid of being killed because uh, he has a beautiful wife, because he should trust God. And um, Abraham was playing with fire. God's command to him in Genesis 17 was, walk before me and be blameless. That was the command that he instituted uh, circumcision, the, uh, the covenant of circumcision. And I see that Abraham's, Abraham's determination or kind of ignorance in continuing with this wicked practice of continuing with this ruse of Sarah's my sister, it really jeopardized God fulfilling his purpose in his life. And, um, or at least Abraham's enjoyment of it. We know God will fulfill his purpose, but Abraham's enjoyment of God's purpose in his life, I think was really jeopardized. And it made me think, what a tragic waste. What an unnecessary burden that he imposed on his life, all because of some old behavior or some old attitude that he never thought to question again. He just went on autopilot, basically. That's what I see here in this. Because it happened before, right, with the Egyptian that he told someone he was his sister, and it didn't go well with him. But again, in the same circumstance, God gives him another chance, and he goes on autopilot back to the old agreement that he made with Sarah. And the mistake I see here is that they did not question their old practices in light of a new revelation of God. God had revealed himself in so many ways between Genesis 12 and Genesis 20, and yet he didn't question whether these old practices should persist. And I see that a refusal to change after God has revealed himself to us is incredibly dangerous. If God's revealed himself to us, we should be willing to change. It's so damaging to Elijah. I don't know if you know this story from um, 1 Kings 19. It really struck me. It's so damaging to Elijah that it almost, it, it actually did cost him the mantle of being a prophet, being passed to Elisha. If you, if you look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9, we don't have to, we don't have to read it all, but the beginning and the end of the passage between verses 9 and verse 14 is really the point. The basic gist of this is after Elijah, he seized all the prophets of Baal. The prophets of Baal come against him. He seizes them and kills them all. And then Jezebel threatens him. And he basically, he's terrified by Jezebel's threats, so he goes running. And in 1 Kings 19 verse 9, the Lord comes to him and he asks him why he's run away essentially. In verse 9 he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah responds in verse 10, he says, Lord, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. Essentially what he's saying is, I've been so faithful to you, why aren't you helping me? I'm running because I'm afraid you won't help me. It's basically what Elijah, that's what I see Elijah saying to God. I'm afraid of this woman who threatened me so much so that I have to run away. And then in verses 11 through 13, God does this amazing thing. He actually passes by. It says in verse 11, Behold, the Lord was passing by. He displayed this kind of awesome power in verses 11 through 13. And when he comes back, having shown Elijah this, his glory, having demonstrated his magnificent power in all these verses, he asks Elijah the same question. And I think he asks Elijah the same question, hoping that Elijah would be emboldened by this wonderful view of God's majesty. Surely Elijah will feel differently now about the situation. And yet we see in verse 14, his answer literally doesn't change a single word. At the end of verse 13, it says, A voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Same question the Lord asked in verse 9. And then Elijah responds in verse 14, verbatim the same response. I, again, I'll say, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And so he departed from there, and uh, or it says, sorry, in um, verse 15, the Lord responds. And you know what the Lord says when he sees Elijah's view of the circumstance was not changed at all by seeing his glory? It's kind of amazing. He says... In verse 16, Elisha, the son of Shephat, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And then it says in verse 19, that Elijah departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shephat, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him. And he uh, and Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. And so what I see in this story is that God's purpose in revealing his glory is to purge us from some impurities. He wanted, it, with Elijah, he wanted to purge him from this un, completely unfaithful fear of Jezebel. 
And he showed him his glory, and Elijah persisted in his fear. And God said, okay, the, the mantle's got to pass from you. I've got to find a new prophet who's not afraid of Jezebel, essentially. And it just made me think, he, he, the Lord's always wanting to raise the bar with us spiritually. And as he reveals his glory, it should cause a change in us. And sometimes it's a new change, and sometimes it's a questioning of some old pattern of behavior or own uh, some old attitude that we've just never questioned before. But the, call, the Lord wants us to be willing to re-examine our lives whenever we see something new of God. We can't assume that we're good or that old practices, things that we've always done, can prevent persist like Abraham did with Abimelech in Genesis 20 or like Elijah did in the face of these threats in 1 Kings 19. God's desire, it says in 2 Corinthians, is to transform us from glory unto glory. And how does he do it? As we behold him. As we see his glory, it transforms us. And when, his, when seeing his glory doesn't transform us, it's a very dangerous thing. And we should be really concerned if seeing um, unfolding kind of degrees of his glory isn't causing a commensurate or corresponding transformation in our hearts and causing us to question things maybe we haven't questioned before. And seek to be um, purified of the impurities that are, that are remaining in our lives. And um, I was thinking of, th this happened a few years ago. This, this idea kind of first really dawned on me a few years ago. I was considering whether I should continue kind of engaging with some behavior. And we have, is anybody familiar with Pixar or the movie Up? Do you know that movie? It's a really great movie about a guy with a, turns his house into a, a hot air balloon and he kind of flies away. And we had a, we have a, a picture book of it. We have two little girls. We have, of course, we have picture books of all sorts of uh, cartoons. And we have a picture book of this uh, movie called Up. And on the cover, it's just a picture of a hot air balloon. And I was looking at it and I was thinking about this, you know, practice, this attitude that I felt the Lord was calling to question. And I was having this thought, it's never been wrong before, Lord. Is it really wrong now? It's never, you've never taken issue with it before. And he kind of, he's, he just, I saw a pic, I saw the sandbag. I don't know if you, if you know about a hot air balloon, but they have these things called sandbags on the side that basically keep it from going <laughs> into the stratosphere. And if you want to go higher, you have to remove a sandbag. And uh, if you want to stay low, you keep all the sandbags there. And the picture Lord kind of gave me is this of our Christian life should be a continuous upward progression, continuously increasing, right? Always fruitful and increasing in fruitfulness. And the Lord kind of said, hey, this is a sandbag. It's, it's, it's a weight which is going to keep you from continuing to increase. And sure, there have been other things I've wanted to deal with. And those things have been the things which have kept you from growing and you've gotten rid of them. But now that you're here, if you want to continue progressing, I'm asking you to get rid of this sandbag. And if you, if you get rid of this dead weight, you'll continue to progress. You'll continue to go upwards. And it's not that it has to be some new behavior or habit which keeps us from climbing higher, but rather sometimes it's an old attitude. Like for, for me, I'll give you an example. Recently, I have I've become aware of this. I've always been very serious about protecting my time. I've not really tolerated interruptions well, you might say. And um, I think that attitude came, I think early on I heard some business leaders say, you know, allowing yourself to be interrupted means that you don't know you're already that if you're working on the most important thing. If you really believe you're working on the most important thing, you should never be interrupted. And I think as a young, impressionable undergrad, I took that as kind of gospel truth and said, okay, no interruptions. I'm doing my work. Nobody can mess with me. And, um, at, but... And, and that, that behavior has kind of persisted for a long time. But recently, I, I really felt convicted as I saw, not just in the abstract, but as I saw God's loving kindness, his mercy, his compassion, as I'm learning how to be just like Brother Paul was saying, as I'm learning to be a father more like my heavenly father, who's merciful and kind and compassion, who's abundance and loving kindness, as the Psalms say, I start seeing there's this disconnect between God's kindness and compassion and my own miserly attitude towards towards my time and my own miserly attitude about my attention and it started to bother me and I felt like the Lord was requiring me to kind of change my policy so to speak whereas before I had this policy of just say no to interruptions all of a sudden that becomes a sandbag that the Lord says hey I want you to get rid of that just like Abraham's hey tell him he's my tell him I'm your brother right all of a sudden I've got to get rid of that or it's going to keep me from progressing in my Christian life and it, what's funny is it, it's just something that hadn't bothered me for years, but I'm convinced that the attitude, just because it didn't bother me, didn't mean it was, ne it was right. It just means that I didn't have light. But now that I have light, I've got to get rid of it. 
And that the reason, I, I know that the reason the Lord hadn't brought it up with me before is that there were other serious impediments to my growth that he needed to deal with first. But as he's dealt with, with those things, then he wants to keep drawing me higher, drawing me deeper, drawing me closer into Christ-likeness. And I really feel like if I had refused to even question that attitude, if I'd said, no, 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 this has always worked for me, ignoring your distractions has always worked for me, I think it would have stunted my Christian growth. And I think that my progress would have stagnated and I would no longer be useful for the Lord's service. There's a pretty interesting story in um, John 13. Jesus says something pretty amazing in this connection. If you want to turn there, it's in the incident where he's washing his disciples' feet. And um, as we all know, I'm sure, it's John 13. The incident starts in verse 5. But what I really want to focus on is verses 8 to 10. But he comes to Simon Peter, and, he's, and Simon Peter says to Jesus, Lord, do you wash my feet? And I, I think what he's saying here is, don't you dare wash my feet. I can't imagine you washing my feet. And then Jesus answered and says to him, what I do, what I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And then Peter said, he got indignant a little bit. I think self-righteous. Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus' response is amazing here. He says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. If I don't wash you, you'll have no part with me. And I love Simon Peter's response. He says, okay, Lord, then not only wash my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus says to him, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. And so what I see here is Jesus conceded Simon Peter had been cleansed. His salvation had been settled. And yet, despite the fact that he was completely clean, he still insisted that unless he washed Peter's feet, he couldn't have any part with him. So what does that mean? What does it mean to not have any part with him? I'm not making a statement about salvation. I'll leave that to Bible scholars. But what I'm saying is, it should cause me great disturbance to see that even after having been cleansed completely, if there are little sins that I pick up along the way or little habits that are persisting that the Lord wants to deal with, if th that they're enough to disqualify me from having a part with Jesus. And what I think that means is having intimate, ongoing fellowship with Him. You have no part with me. You can't be one with me. Just like the verse you have up here, you, you, you've got to remain in the vine. If you're a branch, you have to remain in the vine. And if you don't, if, if you aren't diligent to be willing to allow me to cleanse even your feet, even though you've already been washed, you have no part with me. You won't, you won't be useful for my service in the church if you don't let me cleanse your feet. And so I, I, I was thinking, I want to be just like Peter. He has this, I love this, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head. He asked for what, was, what Jesus even considered unnecessary, that he had a desire for an utter cleansing. So much, so much of a desire for cleansing that Jesus had to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, I'm not, you don't need that much cleansing. Just let me, let me look after your feet. And I want to have a lower, it made me think, I want to have a lower estimation of myself and a greater estimation of my own need than Jesus does. Just like Peter, I want to ask the Lord to protect me from thinking more highly of myself and to think less of my need than he does. I want to have the same view of the things that are in my life that he does. And I want to live, I want to hold my life and practices loosely enough, even things I think I'm doing now. I believe that the Lord's not finished with me yet, which means there's, there are things in me that displease the Lord and that he wants to work out of me over time. And I want to hold all of my practices and attitudes and things maybe I think are right, even this moment, loosely enough that I'm willing to call any of those things into question uh, as to whether at this point in my spiritual journey there's something that's keeping me from climbing higher. And I want to be willing for the Lord to ask me to give Him anything. That I might continue to walk, as it says, in a manner worthy of the Lord. That I might act and walk truly as a child of God. And that I might walk according to the revelation that God has given me. So as he reveals himself, my hope and prayer is that it continues to produce a change in me. That I wouldn't ever have an unwillingness in my heart to say, no, 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 that's already good. That's already established. That's already fine. But that at any point, God could call any of my behaviors, attitudes, practices into question. And I gladly say, okay, you don't want me to do that anymore? I won't. And as such, that he would be able to continue to transform me from one degree of glory to the next until Christ returns. So may God help me.